Hello, everyone. Now, I'm a bit hesitant to um, introduce this last speaker, not because it's the last speaker, but because he usually, I know, I know, our time has been so sweet, but I'm kind of glad because I want to sleep. But you all have been wonderful. <laughs> uh, but um, usually he makes everyone cry. So if you could just, you know, be prepared, steal yourselves, gird your loins, whatever that means. I don't know what girding, what is, anyway, just think about that. <laughs> all right then, and so <laughs> our last speaker is actually the co-founder of Skepticon. Back when we were younger and crazier, or maybe we're still young and crazy, I don't know. We, uh, we started a on-campus group and we invited two speakers, PZ Myers and Richard Carrier, and the rest is history, and here we are now, six years later, still rocking it. So, okay. <laughs> Please help me welcome to the stage my fellow pirate, JT Eberhard. I blame you. <laughs> oh, Skepticon. I was talking to a friend the other day, talking, wow, how does John Corvino do that? <laughs> um, I was talking to a friend the other day about Skepticon. Um, they asked, are you excited to be back? Are you nervous to be on stage? And I said, no, I'm not really nervous to be on stage because I do this for a living now. But I feel like I've kind of grown up with this event. You know, aside from helping to start it and, and helping to run it the first few years, does anybody else feel that way? Like, if Skepticon 4 is the first time I ever held Michaelin's hand at a Skepticon, then at Skepticon 5, I asked her to marry me. And here we are at Skepticon 6, and I likened it to uh, rings inside of a tree trunk and all the life that goes on in between them. And the Skepticon to me is kind of those lines. OK, so here we are again. Um, before I get to the end of my talk, and I do this every year because it's so mandatory, none of the people who put on this event get paid at all. They do it for you, for the movement. And in lieu of any money, even though I'm a classically trained musician, I know the, the ethics of asking an audience to give a standing ovation, I think it would be incredibly appropriate right now if we all stood up and applauded the team that put this on. They've worked so tirelessly for all of us. And two more things I want to get out of the way before I get into my talk. Uh, Rob, the videographer here, has a donation box over there. Um, what he gives to Skepticon in terms of foregoing any payment for doing this, the amount of equipment he provides, uh, the cost to hire someone to do all of those things would be astronomical. So if you've got an extra buck or two, throw it into his bin. It won't be as much as he would make otherwise, but at least give him a little something. Um, also, you guys have seen the, the painting that uh, the extremely talented Adam Brown did of me. Uh, that he's auction we're doing a silent auction for charity. I decided what charity today I want that money to go to. It's going to be the Secular Student Alliance. So if you... If you support the SSA and you want my creepy ass face staring at you every day, <laughs> go throw a, 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 an offer up on that painting. All right. When we first conceived this is not working, Stop that, stop that. Oh my god, are you kidding me? There. Is this going to do this? Oh, there we go. OK. Uh, when we first conceived of Skepticon, we conceived of an event where people could come and see their idols without any financial barrier beyond like travel and food. But if, if you had a hero, there's a good chance you could come to Skepticon and not just see them speak, but sit next to them and talk to them and run up and occupy their time and annoy the piss out of them. Um, <laughs> And we all know who those heroes are. We all, we all know our idols of the movement. And for the idols of the movement, people like, uh, I don't say I'm an idol of movement, but people who are like me in the fact that they do it for a living. They get paid to have opinions on religion and argue with religious people and be activists. Our life is really, really easy. It's what we do. It's easy to be a hero under those circumstances. It's not easy for the people who have full-time jobs or more than one full-time job doing something else. 
and they get home after a long day of work and they're sweaty and they smell like car grease and they just want to fucking play video games for a few hours before they go to bed and do it again. And they don't. And they go to their computer and they start organizing for their local meetup. Or they start arranging for their group to come to Skepticon. Those are the people that really bust their ass. And they're heroes that don't get a lot of credit. They don't get any recognition. They don't get any pay. But for my talk today, I want to make us aware of some of the heroes of secularism and atheism that you've never heard of. I'm going to start out with one of my favorites. This doesn't change on here before it changed up there, and that's going to get real awkward. Uh, this is Amira Osman Hamed. She's a Sudanese engineer. She was arrested in 2009 in violation of Article 152 of the Sudanese Penal Code for what? Does anyone know? Wearing pants. Wearing trousers, she was arrested. And she's just been arrested again for refusing to cover her head. And following her hearing on uh, November 4th, she waits the results of her prosecution. If found guilty, she could be sentenced to up to 40 lashes as punishment. But she said that even in the, in the face of physical violence, in response for not covering her head, that she would rather take the physical violence than submit to Sharia law. Anytime someone walks up to me and says, yeah, I'm your biggest fan, I know they're lying because I'm my biggest fan. <laughs> uh, I like me. I'm very happy with the person I am. But even I can admit I've got nowhere near that amount of bravery in me. More power to her. And I'm happy to tell her story. This is Sarah Shepard. And I'm going to uh, read to you from, uh, oh, I forgot to put down what newspaper this is from, but I think it was the New York Times. Um, she says, instead of teaching economics, her teacher would teach us that certain historical people were among the greatest because of their spiritual enlightenment. He also expressed to the students that it was human nature to have a spiritual and religious component, therefore making atheists unnatural and against human nature. This is in a public high school. The teacher went so far with this idea to even compare atheism to smoking and how the body originally rejects smoking, just like the mind rejects the concepts of atheism. In high school, where popularity means everything, to speak out against this means the loss of friends, and it did to Sarah Shepard. It could mean possible reprisal from administrators and teachers that don't realize the boundaries of their power. And Sarah did it anyway. She contacted the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and a few letters later from people with scary initials behind their names, this process was put to a stop, even to whatever cost Sarah paid for it. Go ahead. Speaking of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, we all know about Dan Barker and Annie, Lawyer, Annie Laurie Gaylor. This is Andrew Seidel. Andrew Seidel is one of the nicest, kindest, most intelligent people you will ever meet. And when you read the press releases on the FFRF, he's often the person who wrote them. He's also often the person who wrote the big scary letter to the school or whatever government institution was fucking around and put a stop to it. The man is a genius and he deserves more speaking gigs. How many SSA people in this room? Cheer if you're an SSA person. It's a great organization. I can't say enough good things about the SSA, and I'm really happy uh, to, to send whatever uh, proceeds go from that, my half, to the SSA. If you worked with the SSA, you probably encountered Susie Lewis uh, as an employee of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Everybody knows about the Richard Dawkins Foundation, but not everybody knows about her. She can often be found uh, tabling at conferences, handing students free merchandise to use uh, for activism on their campuses. As the manager of the RDF store, she uh, arranged for uh, student groups to get merchandise on conscription at cost and free and then just send back whatever they sell. This has helped so many student groups and she has been a personable face, a real face, not just a nameless person in a warehouse somewhere. I'm sad to announce, and I found this out just the other day, that uh, she has been removed from the RDF as they've trimmed it down to cover expenses. She will be missed, and any organizations looking to hire a person who will make a difference, who will work extra hours, who will come up with new ideas to help people really serve the cause better. You could not do better than Susie Lewis. If you're in the SSA, you know this. Give a free cheer for Susie, because I know she's watching.
Speaking of the Secular Student Alliance, everybody's seen Jesse Galef, their communications person on CNN. Liz Liddell is the heart of the SSA. I think I'm a hard worker. Remember me being my own biggest fan? When I worked there, I came in and I was like, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to work extra hours. I'm going to make this position everything I can. And it got to the point where I had to realize that I was doing a good job, even if I couldn't work as hard as Liz Liddell. Liz Liddell, you've never seen a person take fewer breaks and work more overtime for a cause she believes in. When I relapsed into anorexia when I was working with the SSA, she didn't fire me. She took my medication, gave me a pill every day. The SSA would not be what it is without Liz Liddell. And the student movement, which has grown exponentially over the last five years, which is about when Liz Liddell came on with the SSA, owes an unbelievable amount to her. Anytime you see the SSA do something good or a student group do something good, praise the student group, but send a little praise in your prayers to Liz Liddell, because she helped make it happen. The Deep Fried Freethinkers. It's, it's just a blog run by Nathan Piccolo and his, uh, and his partner, Twinkie D. But anytime there's a need for fundraising in the movement, we all see Hemant do fundraisers, but these people are always right in behind them. Uh, they worked with the Northeast Mississippi Secular Humanist Association to raise money for a Beat the Heat campaign. Miss okay, I've given talks in Mississippi. It's a swamp. You have never been to somewhere more muggy and miserable in terms of weather than Mississippi in the summer. And they raised, two years ago, over $800 which allowed them to buy seven air conditioning units for needy families there in, in uh, Mississippi. And then they did it again. And this last year, they raised enough to buy 17 of them just through their blog. And they had a little bit left over. They used to buy school supplies for students in Mississippi. And let me tell you, students in Mississippi need all the help they can get. I write about creationism. I'm aware of this. Uh, Shayra Akers, podcaster. Someone see something? OK, maybe she's not as unsung as I thought. Um, tireless worker. Um, she, uh, she arranges all kinds of hangouts online for up-and-coming people who want to get better at philosophy and talking about religion to interact with their heroes and, and the geniuses of the movement. She does podcasts galore. If you ever get a chance to check out her work, do it. Her partner, Daniel Moran, running, running for an atheist, an open atheist, running for Congress out of Texas. <laughs> Texas. And you may have seen on the Friendly Atheist blog, there was, there was the, the politician there. Um, oh, God, what, what was he talking about? Oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm ad-libbing here, but this is such a good story if I could just remember what it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, chaplains in the military. Uh, and he was doing a, a, a town hall meeting at a church. And Daniel shows out and calls him out on his bullshit, kindly, nicely. And there's the, the answer was terrible, but if you get a chance to look at the video, you'll see what a bold and absolutely fearless person Daniel was. Now, you, normally, if, if you're in the, that kind of environment, you, you might get up and just be a little sheepish, like, I'm Daniel Moran, and I'm an atheist, and, um, did, did, yeah. and boy, he, he just did, he could give less than a fuck, it seemed. Um, <laughs> just so brave. This is the part I've actually really been looking forward to here. Uh, Skepticon is here because Lauren and I went to college at Missouri State University, just up the road. And while I was here and studying music, I got cast in the premiere of a musical called Frog Kiss. And the music director for that show was Ned Wilkinson, who was a nominal uh, Christian at the time, uh, and, and that has since ceased to be the case. And he's become a composer since then. And this last year, he wrote a musical about examining faith, uh, about the arguments for God's existence and, and why they might fail, called T.J. and Mr. Oaksite. This was seen by tons of people. The reviews were great. And they got exposed to arguments against religion and the joy of godlessness. And I emailed Ned this last week, because while this was in production, he was sending me demos of all the songs as the cast was recording them for the demo copy. And he sent me one that just became one of my favorite songs immediately. I loved it. And I emailed him that, this last week, and I asked him if I could sing it here. And he said yes. So I even got Shelly Seagal to volunteer to come up and help me with this. And Shelly, Shelly picked this up one day ago and is going to come up here and sing it with me. Let me get this hooked up. 
I'm from Arkansas, and we just recently heard of technology. <laughs> yeah, you can put that there. Go nuts. Let's get you a microphone, too. No opera here. Oh, you got one. Wow, a skeptic computer. Hello, everyone. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, so <laughs> Ned sent me two versions of the backing track. He sent me one of them that's just the backing track, and then one of them with an intro. And the intro was so funny, I decided to use that one, even though I think he sent it to me as a joke. So here we go. First off, thanks so much for being the first person outside of the cast and crew of TJ and Mr. Oaksite to ever perform this song. I'm truly honored. A few things. First, remember that you can't sell your version of this song yet, since I still need to get a sample clearance from Richard Dawkins. Second, after you sing the line, there is no God, jazz hands. Yeah, jazz hands. In our production, we tried it both with and without jazz hands, and the with jazz hands version works like a charm. Finally, show your audience some love. This song should end with you down on one knee, arm spread, just like Billy Crystal hosting the Oscars. Break a leg, JT. We are going to die. Isn't that amazing? I'm not ready yet, but I'll go out blazing, living on the edge, feeling only every drop from the only life I'll get. I'm one of the lucky ones. I won't acquiesce. If you're asking, is that all there is? I'm one of the lucky ones. How'd you like to be one too? We are going to die like all generations. I'll console myself with congratulations. Countless other beings won't know what they missed. They were not as lucky. They never will exist, but I do. I'm one of the lucky ones Why would I complain? That would be a waste Of my fully functional brain I won this lottery With a big gigantic check I'm one of the lucky ones On this planetary speck Welcome to episode 42 of the video podcast of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster here on the tediously Midwestern campus of Springfield State University. I'm your host, Zach Paulson. No, I'm your host, Dill Matthews. We can't both be hosts. Schism within the church. Oh, that's all right, Dill. All churches make up crap as they go along. The difference? Our church admits it. And that's not all. Here's a minor doctrinal difference. Zach and Dill went up the hill to shout, there, there is no God. Put down, down that, that book, book of fairy tales. tales. Stop praying to a fraud. It's your responsibility to give your life some purpose. You grade yourself on your own curve. So why would you be nervous? Mortality? Mortality. The rate is holding steady. So your condition's terminal. Get over it already. We are going to die, older may be young. A final taste of life, the last thing on our tongues. That makes us the lucky ones. Hello, JT. First off, thanks so much for being the first person outside of the camp. I skipped lunch break. Hold on, let me get myself resituated here. Remember, technology, Arkansas. This looks really awkward after John Corvino's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I skipped uh, dinner break or lunch break so I could test out audio there, and everything worked fine. God hates me. <laughs> I must be doing something right. Um, but, I, but I wanted to include Ned here because it's not just atheists that are going to go see that show. It's believers who are going to get exposed to these arguments. And they may not even leave with changed minds, but they will leave with new understanding of who we are. 
and nobody knows. It's another unsung hero of the atheist movement. This guy is pretty sung. Everybody knows about American atheists. Not everybody knows that Greg Lammers is the guy who uh, organizes their state directorship program and is one of the best human beings you will ever meet. Always in a good mood, always caring. When the first Skepticon was coming up, um, he took Michael, uh, Lauren and I out to dinner when we came up to MU to talk about it and then handed us $200 for the event. And I thought this was just you know, from an organization. This was out of his own pocket just because he believed. He helped make the first one, and look what it's become. It's not just Lauren and me and everybody else. It's the people like Greg who helped to make it happen. He's a wonderful guy, and American Atheist is lucky to have him. When I gave my talk at Skepticon 4, and I asked the atheist movement, the skeptic movement, to start picking up mental illness and to start saving lives and making lives better, by debunking the bullshit surrounding uh, psychology and mental illness to help, uh, remove the stigma and make life better for people like me. Nobody took up the call better than Kate Donovan, who's a blogger at Freethought Blogs. Her writing on uh, mental illness and skepticism about mental illness is literally second to none. It's, uh, I, 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 the word I wanted to say was more profuse, but that's not it. Um, uh, certainly greater in bulk and greater in quality than anywhere else I've ever read. And if you suffer from mental illness and are, uh, you want to know more about what you can do to help as a skeptic, I cannot recommend her blog more. And the flip side of that coin, Mary Mogilevsky, not Mogilevsky, who would ever pronounce it that way? Um, thanks, Mary, for correcting me the other night. Um, if I could pick one writer, and then there are certainly many who could, uh, who, who could fit this bill. But one writer who I think writes with the most integrity of anyone I've ever met, I think it's Mary. Mary and I don't agree on everything. But when she disagrees with someone, she can say so and write to correct them without declaring enemies of people who share the same causes as her. And she can treat her opponents fairly and honestly. And if you ever want to see someone who writes with that type of integrity, I cannot I uh, recommend her blog more, and it's on the Freethought Blogs Network. Ben Blanchard. Ben is currently overseas as part of the Pathfinders project with Foundation Beyond Belief. He'll be there until July of 2014. Uh, according to the Freethought uh, Free Blogs, uh, Foundation Beyond Belief, people in the Pathfinders project will complete clean water education and sustainability projects in Asia, Africa, and Latin America engage in dialogue across religious, cultural, and ethnic boundaries, assess countries and partner organizations with the ultimate goal of selecting one site for launching the Humanist, Humanist Service Corps, which is a future program of Foundation Beyond Belief. I argue with religious people for a living, and I love what I do. Anytime someone comes up to me at a conference like this and says, thank you for all your hard work, it, it's like thanking me for living at Disneyland. It's, I, I love what I do. Ben is, I'm sure he loves what he does, but he's giving up a year of his life, not to spread atheism, but to live by humanist values and, and see the product of those values borne out in reality by traveling across the world to make people better, or to make life better for people who have far less than us. I've never done that. This guy's a hero. And like everybody else in this presentation, one of the nicest people you will ever meet. This is Kathy Goodman. When I was with the SSA, there was an article published in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education titled, From Misconceptions to Inclusion, talking about the travails that atheist students have to go through just to fit in in a Christian America and public schools. I cited this article, if not daily, then every other day. This article made a huge difference to high school students as I built that program. I don't know if Kathy's watching. I know she follows my blog and follows my Facebook, and I know I'm going to post the video of this talk on there, because once again, I'm my own biggest fan. Um, but for Kathy, who helped write that article, for all the high school students she has helped, please give her a round of applause. Let her know the secular movement appreciates what she has done. Uh, the other half of that coin was John Mueller. Uh, he, he helped publish the paper as well. Uh, he's recently published an article called Understanding the Atheist College Student, a qualitative examination in the, uh, in the Journal of uh, Student Affairs and Research, 
or Juno Fair stu Student Research and Practice, I think. I don't know, I'm not an ac academic, I studied music. Um, but he also helped author that paper, and I know he follows my blog. Please give him a round of applause for all the students his work has touched. Because it wasn't just me citing this stuff. The SSA uh, sends pamphlets and literature to principals at schools to let them know that there is this need to give special attention to the atheist students who might be dealing with bullying or discrimination. And in every single one of those, this paper is studied. It's one of the most important pieces of literature that's come out in this movement. As much as I love Richard Carey and all his books, I'd say this piece of paper is up there. One more time, round of applause for them. I, I can't exaggerate the work they've done. Amy Monsky, mother of three, I believe, runs one of the most successful um, public atheist groups in the entire country, the Skeptics of the Lowland in Charleston, South Carolina. She's a counselor at Camp Quest, multiple Camp Quest. In fact, she's running Camp Quest South Carolina this year. Also has a full-time job uh, and, and is looking for more work. Please give her a round of applause for all the work she's done. Not, not paid for any of it. If ever there was someone who embodied the axiom that virtue is its own reward, it's this woman. This woman that nobody else has ever heard of. I'm going to do what every communications teacher tells you never to do. And there's going to be some, surely my college communications teachers in the audience just waiting to give me an F for this. But now I do it for a living, so. Um, this is uh, to quote the New York Times. For nearly three decades, an earnest man named Narendra Dabokar traveled from village to village in India, waging a personal war against the spirit world. If a holy man had electrified the public with his miracles, Dr. Dabokar, a former physician, would duplicate the miracles and explain step by step how they were performed. If a sorcerer had amassed a fortune treating infertility, he would arrange a sting operation to unmask the man as a fraud. His goal was to drive a scientist's skepticism to the, into the heart of India, a country still teeming with gurus, babas, astrologers, godmen, and other mythical intra, intra, entrepreneurs. English, fun language, you can speak it too. <laughs> and for this, this last year, he was shot and killed. This man did more for the advancement of skepticism in a place that desperately needs it I don't feel bad saying than probably anybody in this room. And it's a pity, almost a crime, that none of us have ever heard of him. He can't hear us from beyond the grave. But maybe a round of applause for everybody who would follow him and follow his example. And sometimes the unsung heroes become sung heroes. The Center for Inquiry on Campus, which, like the SSA, serves college groups around the country, several hundred of them, recently picked up Sarah Kaiser. In, I believe, 2008, Debbie Goddard, whom, whom I never heard of, found me as the organizer of my college group here and invited me to this conference and helped me to get a, a grant from the CFI to get to the conference. And it was life-changing. This was probably my birth as an activist. And at that conference, I met another student activist named Sarah Kaiser, equally passionate, if not more so, extremely intelligent. And since they've picked her up, the, uh, the effectiveness of the CFI on campus program and the reports I'm hearing from, uh, from college groups around the country has gone up tremendously. She's made a huge difference from someone who just a few years ago was a student like me. Another person I met at that conference was Joel Goodormson, now the uh, media and event coordinator, or outreach and event coordinator for the Richard Dawkins Foundation just a, a student activist who wound up becoming someone of import in the movement who's helping get Richard Dawkins to college groups across the country. <laughs> when I say the Skepticon crew works tireless hours and extremely hard for no pay, I should have also said that they make tremendous sacrifices. There have been several times over the course of this last year, which is how long it takes to plan and put on Skepticon, when Lawrence called me up saying, I don't know if we're going to get the money, and it's just, I'm worried all the time, and I'm losing sleep, 
And is, is this all worth it? And she knew the answer. I knew the answer. Of course it's all worth it. Look what Skepticon has done. We've gone from such a little ragtag group to something that changes the secular movement every year and advances new names. Lauren Lane is a hero, and she's been doing it for six years. And not only her, Jeffrey Marcus makes the same sacrifices. So does Floyd, so does Rob, so does Blythe Clutter and Micah Weiss. Like I said earlier, it's easy for me to do it. Every day I wake up and I write about how terrible religion is, and I pay the bills doing that. These people are students, and they have other jobs, and they do it for no other reason than to make a religious world less religious and, frankly, therefore, better. Whoops, well, sorry. That's, sorry, there, fix that. Um, but JT, you're so biased. Yeah, I am. Doesn't make me wrong. Um, <laughs> Mike Lins, she was in the R2-D2 outfit the other day, and it, she, it, I have probably my biggest fan base turn out here at Skepticon every year, and so of course I get, you know, hi JT, I read your blog, and I love your work. And so now, of course, she gets pulled aside, like, oh, Michelin, you're JT's right. Um, <laughs> But people have heard of her now because she's attached to me, but before that, she ran as the president, and before that, as other officer positions, one of the most successful and largest college groups in the entire country. How many of you have heard of ReasonFest? ReasonFest? <laughs> one of the bigger free conferences. She was uh, in charge of that last year as president of SOMA. She helped run the previous ones. Once again, for no money, and for a celebrity that should have far exceeded what she's gotten by being my fiance. In a just and fair universe, this is what would have made people recognize her. No one knew about that, but here she is, and she's still doing activist work, even at my side. <laughs> even if that's just keeping me <laughs> under control. One of the greatest things that the LGBT movement has going for them is the, the, the notion that it's great to come out of the closet. I can make all the greatest arguments in the world for why marriage equality should be legalized and realized as a value, and all of those will have less impact than someone you love coming out of the closet. And this is what's happening in America. So many Americans are realizing, most of them for the first time in their lives, that not only do they know gay people, they like gay people. And the same must be true of atheists. All the arguments I could concoct for why God doesn't exist will matter less than finding out that someone you love doesn't believe in God. Because someone may think that atheists are pathological in the extreme, but they may not think their daughter is pathological in the extreme, or their parents, or their best friend. This is a powerful avenue to changing the world and changing minds that is unavailable even to Richard Dawkins himself. But it doesn't come without a cost most of the time. Most of us know that if a high school student comes out of the closet as a non-believer, there's a very good chance they could wind up without a college education or being ostracized from their family. In certain parts of the country, if you come out of the closet as an atheist, it's a very real possibility you could lose your job and worse. And even as an adult, you could be ostracized from your family. Earlier this year, I was invited to the college at uh, the University of Chicago at Champaign-Urbana, and I met a closeted student there who had everything to lose for coming out of the closet. But he realized the value of doing it, and he realized the value of owning yourself even in the face of people who wish you were some other way. And he's decided, I don't know if he's done it yet, but that at some point, he's going to roll the dice, and he's going to take ownership of his own life. I'm not that brave. I get to be on stage giving advice to all of you and pretending to be smart enough that my opinions should matter. And I'm less brave than a nameless boy in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Of course. There we go. Um, this is Elliot and Gail. Elliot and Gail live in Tennessee. Uh, lately in Tennessee, uh, public groups are starting to pop up everywhere, and college groups are doing a little better. 
This is because these two are organizing speakers to come in and do tours in the state of Tennessee. They're diverting funds and uh, advice to all the public groups. So for the explosion of atheism that's happening in Tennessee, you can thank these two. Not paid a dime, not wanting any recognition, doing it just for the cause. <laughs> Dr. Daniel Finca. For those of you who have met Daniel Finca, he's a blogger on the Patheos Network. He writes the blog Camels with Hammers. He is one of the most clear thinking and erudite people in the atheist movement, and just so incredibly down to earth, which is why whenever he refers to himself as Dr. Finca, I can't help but laugh, of it, laugh at him. It just doesn't fit for him. But if you ever get a chance to read his blog, you should. It's, it's a crime that my blog gets more hits than his. When I was in high school, one of the men who will be my groomsman, one of my groomsmen at my wedding, my friend Jeremiah, uh, one of my best friends in the entire world, we got into a lot of trouble. He's, he helped me be one of the reasons that my parents deserved a much better child than what they got through most of my youth. Um, Die-hard Christian family, extremely religious. Uh, this is his sister, Michelle. She married Brian, another die-hard religious uh, person. Uh, and whenever we'd hang out, you know, we'd, t we'd talk about God, and, and they were into it, and they were, they were going to raise their children to be agents of the Lord. And over time, Brian developed doubts. He's told me this through some of the conversations we had. And eventually, he walked away from it. Now, I get emails all the time from people asking me, my partner is religious, and I'm leaving the faith. What do I do? And in more cases than not, certainly not all the time, but in more cases than not, six months later, their partner is also an atheist. Once it's established that you can live without the fear of hell, that it's okay, that lightning won't strike you, and that life can even be better owning yourself, not having to abide by the taboos that force you to give up the parts of humanity that make you curious about certain things, a lot of times they change too. And so did Michelle. And when they changed, they came out of the closet immediately. And in time, Michelle's mother changed. She became an atheist. And in time, so did her sister. And even Jeremiah no longer considers himself a Christian. Their whole family changed. And this year, when Christmas comes around, we all get to meet up back in Mountain Home, Arkansas, all of our families together, all of us believing the same things about the nature and beauty and glory of the universe. This is how you can change the world just by being yourself, which in this country is often harder than it should be. And it takes a lot of courage, but it works. How many of you have ever heard someone say, why do you argue with religious people? Why do you talk to religious people? You never change anybody's mind. Anybody ever heard that? This room is full of ex-Christians. It's full of people that changed their mind because they heard an argument that helped them to change their mind. Yeah, we can donate money to organizations, and yeah, we can put up billboards, and it's all good stuff, and it's all necessary stuff, but if you want to change minds, it starts with the courage to be yourself. And it takes a lot more courage to do that than to put up a billboard. Dr. David Berger. One of, the, one of the pieces of praise I most often get is like, when you debate, you're so quick on your feet. How, how do you do that? Your, your arguments are so good. Many of my arguments came in college from Dr. David Berger, watching him standing up on the free speech zone up at the Missouri State campus, arguing with Brother Jed about whether or not gay people should be able to hold hands. I am in great part who I am today because of him. I imagine even your heroes, the Richard Carriers, the Richard Dawkins, are who they are because of people you've never heard of. I refer to David as the greatest activist you've never heard of. The KCAC group you've been hearing so much about lately, the Kansas City Atheists, the ones that tried to uh, help distribute meals and were told they couldn't because the group wanted to evangelize instead. He helped start that group and he helped design their, uh, their, their, uh, their activist philosophy. He even gave a talk on it that I think is on YouTube somewhere. If you ever want advice on how to be an effective atheist, don't ask me. Go to YouTube and watch his talk, David Berger. And actually, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story real quick. Uh, he's not really a, a doctor, it turns out. Um, we had a radio show on, on college campus, uh, a liberal, liberal talk radio, is that what it was? Rational, Rational talk radio, uh, which if you listen to Fox News nowadays, is kind of an oxymoron. Um, and uh, 
That was back when Ken Hovind was doing his thing. And we had religious people calling into the show, being like, have you heard this argument by Ken Hovind? And just over and over we, again, we had this, like, he got his diploma from a diploma mill, from an unaccredited school run out of a hut. Like, his, yeah, you, you can read his PhD you know, uh, thesis. It's just terrible. And it's like, no, no, he's a doctor, and you're not a doctor, and so you should listen to him. And so finally, we, we started our own fake university, uh, and David gave himself four degrees. Um, <laughs> Four PhDs, one of them in everythingology. Uh, I, I think what was admittance to our college was like two baby Ruths or something per credit hour. Uh, so then whenever they say, like, he's a doctor, you should listen. Well, I have four PhDs, and you should listen to me. And it just stuck, and it became part of his identity. Speaking of KCAC. <laughs> I think some of them are in the house. For the last couple years, they've helped the Kansas City Rescue Mission, which claims its first priority is to feed the needy to distribute meals at Thanksgiving. In fact, last year, some of the atheists stayed a little later and used their own cars and their own fuel to help deliver extra meals, even beyond what they had signed up for, just to make sure they all got delivered. And this year, they tried to contact the Kansas City Rescue Mission to say, hey, we're eager to help again. And for a month, they tried to do this and got no response, till finally they wrote back a very brief email that said, we've decided that this year, we're not going to do charity just, I'm paraphrasing here because this is how I feel, we're not going to do charity just for charity's sake, we're going to use our charity as a means to evangelize to the needy. And you guys don't fit in. I've done a lot of charity work, and I've never seen a charitable organization that has more volunteers than they know what to do with. And the Kansas City Atheists were their largest contingent of volunteers every single year. And so what did they do? Well, they went public with it, as well they should have. If we always hear religious people say, religion makes you more charitable. What we very seldom hear in response is, when your religion causes you to nix volunteers or to send Bibles instead of food, Religion has not made you more charitable. It has hamstrung your charitable efforts. And that's a message that needs to get out. But it's not because they hate religious people. They've worked with a religious organization for the last few years to help feed the poor. And when they went public with this, they were inundated with other organizations, many of them religious. We need volunteers, because we're a charitable organization. Come volunteer with us. And they've elected to do it. They're working hand in hand with the Micah Ministries, a religious organization who, though we may disagree on theology, can at least agree that the poor need to be fed. And they need to be fed to the greatest if level of efficiency that we can. And that means working together, not just evangelizing. Ellen Lundgren ran an extremely successful uh, college group and later and has now become the Texas uh, regional operative for the SSA. She replaced Kevin Butler, who started and ran the North, Secular, North Texas Secular Student Convention. Extremely cheap event down in Texas that brought in famous atheists to tell them that God doesn't exist. This is Brooke, a high school student. I'm not going to use her last name because of the controversial nature of this. Now, she wasn't in my talk until this morning. She heard me on the Thinking Atheist podcast and then uh, liked the episode and said, hey, I really want to meet you. And I got to meet her yesterday. And she told me about a letter she had to send to her principal. And she sent me the copies of it, so I know this letter exists. I'd like to read to you part of it. Another thing you're not supposed to do as a public speaker is read. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, no fucks given. I'm an atheist. Um, <laughs> When I walked over, Mrs. Such-and-so was telling a group of students that evolution doesn't exist and that scientists are in denial that God exists. She went on to say, I believe that I was created by someone with a brain. It's stupid to think that we're all here by chance. I pointed out that scientists have proven we all came from Africa, and she told me that the Garden of Eden was in Africa. Then she said they did the math, whoever they is, and showed that all the animals could have fit on an ark. Then she said that it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a theist. Did I mention this was her biology teacher? No. Must not have. <laughs> this is not the first time she's made comments involving religion. Anytime somebody says, oh my God, she gets extremely mad and says that we're not allowed to say that because we shouldn't disrespect God. 
Not only is it promoting religion in the classroom, but she's promoting Christianity. People in our school have all different religions. Some are Muslims, Jewish, Mormons, etc. I used to go to a private Catholic school, and part of the reason I came to a public school was so I could be in an atmosphere where religious beliefs weren't being shoved down my throat. Not only is this offensive and hurtful, but it's harmful to the student's education. Evolution is such a large component of biology, and the fact that it's not being taught in a biology class is mind-blowing to me. That would, that would be like my astronomy teacher telling the class that gravity doesn't exist. I told my parents that I could handle this situation on my own, but if this doesn't get resolved, I will get them involved along with the media and anybody else I need to get involved. Even if you are able to stop her remarks, I strongly suggest hiring science teachers that value facts. Yeah. Especially as a high schooler, it takes a lot of brass to say to an authority figure, what you're doing is wrong, and I'm going to stop you. And it got fixed. Her biology teacher, wordlessly and without complaint, began teaching evolution that very week. And I had no idea who she was until I met her yesterday and heard her story. Brian Fields. President of the Pennsylvania Atheists, helped run the Pennsylvania uh, Freethinker Convention that I spoke at. Wonderful event, one of the better conferences I've ever seen. First year professionally run, tireless worker, great man. Cindy Cooper, Vice President of Camp Quest, Oklahoma. <laughs> Wonderful person, finally got to speak at Reason in the Rock and got some of the acclaim that is due to her. Angel Down, which is not the guy on the right, Along with Ann Orsi, who's in, in the audience right here, I believe. Ann Orsi, Leewood Horvath, ran Reason in the Rock, one of the up-and-coming best-run conferences in the country, run out of Little Rock, Arkansas. Do it for free. No reward. No attention. They need attention. Give them a round of applause. Derek Colonando runs the skeptic track at DragonCon every year. Doesn't get paid for this, just does it to advance the cause of skepticism to people who might not have been exposed to it yet. Sarah Moorhead. <laughs> President of Recovering from Religion. This talk, I, I literally thought this talk was gonna take 30 minutes and it's taking longer so I'm zooming through it. Uh, Sarah Moorhead, President of Recovering from Religion, helped run Apostacon, which is one of the greatest conventions I've ever been to, and if they do Apostacon too, you owe it to yourself to get there. It was an amazing time. Woo! Michael Dorian, in New York, one of the biggest people behind the atheist church movement. I got asked a few years ago, how do you feel about atheist churches? It's like, I hate them. Churches for religious people. We have gatherings, we're family. But you know what, I've kind of come around on that. We all serve the movement in different ways. We all call ourselves different things, atheists, agnostics. I prefer atheists because it's unambivalent. But if you want to call yourself a church, and if that gets people out to hear about atheism, even if it says a gateway drug to actual atheism, <laughs> knock yourself out. It's great work, it's great work. <laughs> Nisa Sensik and J.P. Jennings, the producers and filmmakers who are producing The Scarlet Letter, which is, it's got a private showing here tonight that not everybody can go to because it's invite only, but when it comes out, check it out. They've put money out of their own pocket to put this together, and I think they're actually running in the red. Go to their website, see if it's something you support, throw some money at them. Go watch it when it comes out. I want to give a tremendous thanks to Jesus. No. <laughs> this is Josiah Bible name. Whenever you see pictures, pictures from conferences around the country showing atheists having a good time and living it up and being a huge national family together, a lot of these were taken by him, professional photographer, bringing his own equipment, doing the work, not charging a thing, not wanting the recognition, but showing people the faces of atheism in literally the best possible light. I watched this guy the other day walking around doing this. Because you could walk up to him and tell him something you wanted him to draw and he'd do it for free. Michael and I got myself, Dobby, Dolby, and Michael in her R2-D2 outfit on jetpacks. <laughs> I'm almost done, I swear. 
In a recession, there are two industries that always continue to do well. One of them is education, because nobody has work and they want to go get skills to get a job. The other one is entertainment. Entertainment always does well in a recession, because people are unwilling to live without it, apparently. And just showing up at a conference and increasing the entertainment value for free, even at the cost of your own fucking right hand, that means something. And it means something more than just the smiles people get. It actually contributes to the movement. I thought Stephanie would be here. She's actually uh, checking out colleges right now because she's an awesome student. High school student out of the Kansas City area, started and ran one of the first high school secular student alliances. In Missouri, that takes some brass. The heroes are not the people who do it for a living and get paid to do it. They're not the people who stand up on stage. Our job may be different from the person running a community group, but it is no less essential and it should be no more glorious, even though the reach of our voices is somewhat further. The heroes of the atheist movement are quite literally all around us. They're the faces of the atheist movement that people actually see, and there's not just a handful of them. They're everywhere, and they're interacting with the world. Each of them is not without their flaws, and none of them will agree with all the others on absolutely everything. But they make this movement special, and they've brought it from being an extremely small portion of the populace to a passionate, loud, defiant, and caring movement that is sweeping the country much to the elation of everybody who's lived in fear of religion in the United States. You guys are the heroes. Everybody who puts some of their own money into the buckets so that the organizers of Skepticon who do it for free can do their work to put this on, not just for you, but for the movement and for the nation to advance our cause, you've done something. And it's something for which you, get, you should get recognition. And I can't give recognition to everybody, but I wish I could, because everybody deserves it. There's a million different ways to help the movement. You don't just have to argue with religious people. You can knit a quilt for charity, or draw a painting for charity, or run a community group, or run a conference. There's no one right way. It's like David always said, activism. If you're doing it, you're doing it right. Now, you'll notice some of the pictures I used weren't exactly professional, like Dr. Dave and his piratey best, although I guess that could be considered professional for him. Um, but that's because I wanted to convey that all of us are people, not just images. Even your heroes are just people. And a lot of times we forget that, and we expect perfection of them, and we expect uh, mistakes to never be made, and we expect to agree on every subject, and that's not how it works. All we need to do is care. We need to show up. We need to give what we can, and we need to empathize with the people trapped by religion and the legislators who feel they have to vote based on uh, the opinions of religious constituents. We just have to realize that religion is a force that negatively impacts the world, pure and simple, as is any font of irrationality. And we have to care enough to do something, no matter how little you might think it be, no matter how insignificant. You may not get the recognition for it, but I, the Skepticon crew, Richard Carrier, Richard Dawkins, Seth Andrews, Amanda Keneath, anybody you consider a hero, we love you for it. We're grateful for it. And when the world is different in 50 years, when people don't have to live as much in fear of religion in the United States, when gay people can get married in every state because religion has lost some of its power, you will be the ones we need to thank. And I want to get that out of the way now and thank you for everything. Thank you. We are going to die. And one more round for the Skepticon crew that put this on for no recognition, for no pay. In a strange turn of events, um, JT made himself cry this year, so <laughs> <laughs> whatever, at least I'm not crying yet. <clears throat>